and energy is, is uh, fundamental to life itself. When we found fossil fuels and began using them a couple of hundred years ago, it was as though we had found a treasure chest of energy that had been created over millions of years, gradually stored and concentrated, and it was like nothing else in previous human history. Uh, and one simple measure of that is just population. It's uh, well known that our human population was fewer than one billion at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, through the application of fossil fuels to agriculture and transportation and public health and all sorts of things, we've managed to increase our numbers up to over six and a half billion today. I sometimes catch myself saying six billion, but we're way beyond that. Just since 1999, we've added more than the population, the equivalent of the population of North America. The phantom carrying capacity created by fossil fuels compose about 85% of world energy currently. Uh, with petroleum as number one, uh, coal has moved back into the number two slot, uh, and natural gas number three. Problem is that at some point we will re reach a maximum rate of extraction. And from there on it will all be downhill. And, and we know that will happen because we've seen it in individual oil fields and whole oil producing countries. These are four oil fields, two in Russia, two, two in the U. can take any number of shapes, but they always start at zero and end at zero and there's some kind of peak in between, usually at about the halfway point, a long-term, uh, well-established trend, as they did back in 1930. Uh, Forty years later, in 1970, U.S. oil production peaked, and that's significant because the U.S. at that time was the world's foremost oil-producing nation. In fact, in the early 20th century, America was the foremost oil-exporting nation, where the U.S. imports two-thirds of what it uses now, what happened when U.S. oil production peaked? Well, we applied technology, we started looking for more oil, and both strategies succeeded. We found two enormous new oil producing provinces, uh, North Slope of Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico, and all of that worked. As you can see, uh, U.S. oil production actually has not declined as fast as it otherwise would have. However, it's still declining. Uh, discovering more oil and using more technology are exactly what the oil industry is proposing to avert or delay global oil production peak, which is, again, happening not just in the U.S., but in country after country. Every year there are fewer countries in the category of oil exporters and more countries in the category of oil importers. So, uh, so this is, this is as succinct a definition of peak oil as, as I've seen. It's not a matter of, of totaling up how much oil is left in the world because there's an enormous amount of stuff that either is liquid petroleum or could theoretically be turned into liquid petroleum. The question is, at what rate? At what point will additions to supply be unable to make up for declines in supply? Well, at what point? Where, how, how close are we? Uh, it looks like we're pretty damn close. This is the situation. We saw the peak month of production for regular conventional oil so far in May 2005. The world is, has hit the plateau immediately prior to the actual global oil production peak. And beginning around 2010 or so, we will begin to see declines in the nature of 1 to 2 percent per year. Well, that's significant given the fact that we're overwhelmingly dependent on oil for transportation and agriculture. But there's more to it than that. All oil exporting nations are also, also oil consumers. And what a, a country like the United States really is interested in is not so much the total amount of oil being consumed in the world, but the amount that's available on the export market, because we want to import a lot of that, as do many, many other nations. Well, as prices for oil increase, that in also increases revenues to 
oil producing nations and oil, especially oil exporting nations, so their economies grow. What do they do with that economic growth? Well, people buy more cars and drive more and so on, so their oil consumption is increasing, which means that the amount available for export is decreasing faster than the decline in total global production. The International Energy Agency, headquartered in Paris, which was set up in the uh, 1970s to warn of future oil shocks, who's prepared for this? What country on earth is prepared for 100, 150, 200 dollar a barrel oil? I don't think any of us are, in fact, certainly not the United States. Uh, a uh, study was done for the U.S. Department of Energy a couple of years ago called Peaking of World Oil Production Impacts Mitigation and Risk Management. Essentially, they said, unless industrialized nations like the United States start about 20 years ahead of the peak to prepare for it, at a crash program scale of effort, the result is going to be what the authors call unprecedented impacts, social, economic, and political impacts. And when they say unprecedented, implicitly they're saying this is, this is more serious than the Great Depression or World War II. Natural gas and coal are also finite fossil fuels. What we need to do are peaking studies. When are we going to reach peak coal production globally? Well, a study was just done in Germany by the Energy Watch Group, which reports to the German parliament, looking at the most recent reserves figures for coal globally and found, astonishingly, astonishingly enough, that global coal production is probably going to peak in about 15 years. In China, much sooner. We'll add all of these together. This is all fossil fuels. This is our future, folks. All energy from fossil fuels total peaks around 2010 and declines gradually for the first couple of decades and then much more rapidly after that. Again, who's ready for this? What industrial economy is prepared for this? Uh, next slide. Sources that supply 85% of current world energy are set to decline starting perhaps as soon as five years from now. Do we have a plan B? Do we have a suite of alternative energy sources just waiting in the wings to grow quickly enough to make up for these declines? The answer, unfortunately, is absolutely not. In fact, we're simply going down the well-trodden path of plan A to energy Armageddon. And the path that our national leaders in this country are on is simply one of last one standing. We will use our military to try to gain access to whatever fuel supplies we need. Clearly, the, the energy transition away from fossil fuels is the central theme for the coming century. century. Whether we do it motivated by the, the exigencies of climate change, or we're forced into it by shortage created by peak oil, peak gas, and peak coal, the result is going to be the same. If the 20th century was all about economic growth and growth in per capita en energy consumption and growth in fossil fuel consumption, the 21st century is going to be just the opposite, one way or the other, like it or not, plan for it or not. Um, <clears throat> the reality right now is that it's not rich industrial nations that are cutting back. It's in fact the poor nation, poorest nations that are cutting back on fossil fuel consumption because they can't afford it. Because they can't afford the pesticides and the herbicides and the fertilizers. It's happening in country after country. So, Fossil fuel depletion really adds another element to the whole conversation. It's not just a matter of cutting back on fossil fuel consumption to avert catastrophic climate change. It's also necessary to do so in order to reduce vulnerability to skyrocketing prices for uh, fuels and also vulnerability to oil wars and invasion 
for the takeover of remaining fossil fuel supplies. I think we have to plan this century to relocalize our economies, to turn the movie of globalization in reverse because globalization was always based on cheap transportation fuel. And this may be even a little more radical. I think we're going to have to plan to de-industrialize our economies. Not, it's, this is not just a matter of transferring renewable energy technologies to the less industrialized countries. That certainly needs to happen. But also to de-industrialize the currently industrialized economies and to do so as rapidly and systematically as possible. That, I think, is our only survival strategy.